Thank you all for coming. I'm going to try to get started <coughs> promptly. I'm Libby Gibson, town manager. Thank you all very, very much for coming. We've got a good crowd here. Um, quick introductions. Chuck Larson is our strategic project manager for the town. Chuck is the project manager for the Coastal Resiliency Plan. Uh, we have a consultant that we've engaged to help us develop the plan, Malone and McBroom. We have Noah Sloven from Malone and McBroom and Dave Murphy. And we have um, a special visitor, Steve McKenna from Coastal Zone Management. Uh, Coastal Zone Management is um, the, a state agency that, that assists communities with effort, efforts like this. Uh, just to give a little bit of, of background, we've been discussing a coastal resiliency plan for a while now, and with some prompting by the Nantucket Coastal Conservancy, thank you, Dan, we have really tried to expedite it, and last fall is when we hired Melona McBroom, and we've been working on um, kind of a, a public process and a plan and gathering information, and have ended up trying to design a, um, a, a real way to get public input into the plan. And it, it's considered, and the, the select board has talked about this, this is, this is a community plan. It isn't the select board's plan. It isn't necessarily the town's plan. It's really a plan that the community has had a lot of input in and, and worked to develop. So you'll see maps around the room, and we're going to have a very interactive session, I think, tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Um, to take you through the um, agenda for, for today. Okay. Hi, everybody. David Murphy from Milona McBroom. I have with me tonight Noah Sloven from Milona McBroom. I live in Connecticut. Noah lives in Cambridge or Somerville. Yeah. One of those. <laughs> um, so he's sort of our mass, our mass person on these kinds of projects, and I reside where these kind of got started. And the, a lot of the early coast resilience plans actually came out of Connecticut. And that's largely because the Nature Conservancy in the New Haven office is one of the inventors of the community coast resilience building process. So a lot of the early work was done there. Um, just some logistics before we start. Um, I think you all know where the bathroom is. It's downstairs towards the rear. Um, exits are on both sides. Just follow the illuminated signs. Um, there's resources over on that table. So in the second hour, you can take a look at an early coast resilience plan. Uh, some other publications that we think are interesting that we brought. There are maps all over the room. And as we get to the second hour, we'll explain what we're going to do with the maps and how we're going to do an interactive uh, session. But the voting is for the first hour. So if you feel like you're going to miss the voting and you have to leave early, I think you'll have a chance to do the voting, okay? We're going to get there. Um, I have a geology background. It's not often that I get to put my geology hat on. This is one case where I get to put my geology hat on. I worked on the town's first hazard mitigation plan about 12 years ago. And um, we just worked on the update a couple months ago. We've also done some other work for the town over the years. Uh, I think it's interesting to note the things that we've done for the town are typically for the town. We did a transportation wayfinding study. We did some third-party review for Sconset Beach Project. Again, the important point is we were kind of third-party review working for the town. So we don't do any development work or private work on, on Nantucket, and that I think sort of gives us a little bit of a, some additional, what's the word I want? We're not, we're not sort of tainted by anyone's agenda. Right. Maybe, I didn't want to say that. I can't ever call myself credible, but all right. So an agenda for the presentation, which is the first part of this, this evening, we kept it very straightforward. We're not going to have a very detailed presentation. We're going to talk about what the planning process entails. We'll talk about risk conceptually, and we're going to ask some questions about risk, and that's when you'll be voting. Then we'll talk about some resilience concepts. We throw this word around all the time now, resilience, but what does it really mean? And then we'll have some questions about resilience. And then we'll end the presentation part of it, and then we'll take a break. And the second hour will be voting with, with sticky stickers and uh, post-it notes on the boards and that sort of thing in the back. Okay. So an overview, uh, always good to start with a definition of resilience. There are many definitions you can find out there in the literature. Um, but the, I think the best ones have four parts, and these are really four very important parts. Resisting or preparing, absorbing the storm or, or the event that's occurring, recovering from it, and then adapting so that the next time you don't go through it the same way. So if you see a definition of resilience that doesn't have those four parts, if it's only three parts, I want you to say, that's not the best definition, you need four parts. I didn't invent it, so I can't take credit for it, but just remember to see all four, all four components of resilience are very important um, to making sure that as we go forward in time, we become more resilient. 
So a climate resilience plan considers all aspects of climate change and all impacts of climate change. It typically includes a vulnerability assessment, so you look at what's vulnerable to the changing climate. It sometimes addresses causes of climate change, like where NOAA lives, Somerville and Cambridge, their climate resilience plans talk a lot about reducing carbon emissions. And that's, for some towns, that's important. For others, that's not important. For some towns, they'd rather focus on what to do as a result of the carbon emissions. Sometimes climate resilience plans address other aspects of sustainability, like waste, waste generation. Um, in a coastal community, typically a climate change resilience plan is often similar to a coast resilience plan because the climate change impacts are happening at the coast most visibly, typically. Uh, in this case, the town's plan, coast resilience plan, can be a climate resilience plan by incorporating those non-coastal climate related risks. It's hard to find something on Nantucket that's not coastal though, right? Okay, it's an island. So, uh, you know, so it really is, a, it's just a plan. It's one plan for climate and coastal. So that was climate. What's a coast resilience plan? Typically we have other things that we include. Uh, it's very comprehensive. Talks about local concerns, connecting to other planning efforts. Community risks are oftentimes defined in addition to the vulnerabilities. It's usually very cross-sector, uh, interdisciplinary, brings in people of different backgrounds. Different hazards are typically addressed in the Coast Resilience Plan. Flooding and erosion are the big ones, but um, related hazards as well. Considers future conditions, uh, focuses on resilience. And again, under resilience, the four words that are key. If you ever see a definition with only two or three, it's not, not the best definition. And I think one thing that's really important about coast resilience plans is this very last bullet, uh, strength and position for funding, because funding will be limited going into the future. It's already limited, and a, a good plan can help position you for funds. So possible outcomes of this planning process, these are just possible outcomes. Nothing's predetermined. A roadmap for decision making. On my screen, I have a bad warning. I'm glad you didn't see it. I said PowerPoint stopped working. Are we still good? We're stuck. You tested a hundred times over the course of the day. <laughs> and then this happens. <laughs> so this is a resilience test, yeah. as someone just said. <laughs> well, adapting. I don't know where we, I don't know where we go next. But yeah. All right, we're going to do a quick restart. Maybe I'll, I'll tell you what the second half of the day, the evening is going to go because I was going to do that at the end. I'll just do it now. So after we get through the presentation and the voting, we're going to have boards around the room. They're already around the room. And there's two for each neighborhood. There's the risk board, and you're gonna vote for the three most important risks to address, and then the board beneath it, or next to it, will be what to do about it, the adaptation board. And we're gonna talk about definitions a little bit in the presentation. So you'll be voting with colored dots. It's important to tell you right now, because I always get this question, do the colors matter? No, colors don't matter. We used to try to do that, but then somebody always had the wrong color. So you'll just have a dot, and you'll vote for your top top three risks to address in each neighborhood, and then your top two methods of adapting to those risks in the bottom, the lower board. That's the voting part for the second hour. But you may have comments that aren't just putting a dot in a box, and so then you can write on a post-it note and put it anywhere you like on the board. So that'll be what the, the second hour is mostly about. And we tried in the past to kind of rotate, but it's a smaller room, so we've decided we're not gonna officially rotate through the stations. You can just go to the ones that you want to go to. You can go to all of them, you can go to some of them. But that's what we'll do in the second hour. What we'll also do in the second hour, in addition to that, is we have these comment cards for different kinds of adaptation methods. And you could, there's pictures in the front, you'll recognize some of the pictures. And on the back, there's just uh, two questions. Each comment card has two questions. And so you'll just take a pen or a sharpie and you'll just give us some comments on that. It's all optional. You can do the boards on the wall and the comment cards. You can do only the comment cards and just the boards. Everything's optional. There's no hard and fast rules. But that's what we'll do in the second hour, which feels like it's coming very quickly. <laughs> 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 yeah. Trying to do an update? 
No, no, no. Uh, it's it's just returning this back on. Okay. Five seconds. We're all very patient. Anybody know a good joke? I know none. What's that? <laughs> What's that one? Yeah. Inundation. So that just shows different sea level rise projections. We have um. Or the twenty eighties. Okay. For the so, a few decades out. One thing I'll note right now, while we have the time, so there are sea level rise projections that the feds produce, and the most recent edition is from about a year ago, early 2017. That's what most of us use for planning. In Connecticut, the state has adopted in statute, I think it just passed the session, it just ended, uh, its official sea level rise projections to use for planning at the state level and town level. And Massachusetts is doing the same, we hear, and they have some projections that are coming out. Yay, thank you, Noah. Um, this year. Actually, CZM maybe can tell us a little bit about it when we have a, a break later on. Okay, so I think we covered most of this. What are some possible outcomes of the Coast Resilience Plan? Uh, a roadmap for decision making, uh, design criteria, considerations. It's important to say our plan isn't going to say you must design to elevation 15 everywhere downtown. It's going to say this is how you decide what to design to. So it's criteria, but not the number itself, it's how to arrive at the number. Prioritization of areas to address, strategies to maintain services and to maintain tax base with erosion or flood losses kind of going on in the background, building consensus around areas to implement protection, accommodation, or managed retreat, identifying next steps, and then again, what I said in the last slide, very important funding sources. We're in phase one of a two-phase process. Phase one is our current agreement with the town, which started in sometime in the fall. I think it was about November, December last year. We, we've already completed the first two lines in this, two and a half lines, reviewing existing capabilities. Uh, so what can the town already do? Is it able to apply for grants and you manage grants? The answer is yes. So that's where you look at existing capabilities. Some data collection, what's the best data out there? We're gonna look at some of that today. We assess vulnerabilities and risks. We have public workshops such as this one. We'll be going into review of resilience options. We'll put together a coast resilience framework or plan, kind of a working, a, a living plan. Um, and then we will have, as part of that, implementation tasks that can be followed. Phase two, which we're not under contract for and, and may be coming sometime in the uh, latter part of 2018 into 2019, would be kind of a more focused effort. We would pull from the public um, certain stakeholders or neighborhood organization representatives do some supplemental data collection, working with them individually, have some stakeholder workshops, maybe some additional public workshops at that point as well. We'd go back and take a look at the risks and make sure that we've still characterized them correctly. We'd augment the coast resilience, climate resilience framework, put it together and expand it out to be more of a climate resilience plan, and then have the implementation framework from the previous phase, this one, we'd augment it with additional outcomes and steps. So it's a two phase process. We're in phase one, this is by no means over. We're not going back tonight and writing the whole plan. That is not happening, that's happening later. So what about the hazard mitigation plan? Maybe you've been to some of the meetings. Raise your hand if you've been to one of the public meetings on the hazard mitigation plan. That's, that's great actually. Sometimes there's no overlap between the two and that's alarming, there should be overlap. The previous edition was adopted in 20, 2007. I worked on it at the time, I remember it very well. The update is underway. Um, Actually, the town's hazard mitigation plan was one of the first to talk about climate change, sea level rise, and shoreline change. Believe me, it was one of the first, and, and that was one of the ones that showed FEMA Region 1 that we should include these things in hazard mitigation plans. But there are limits to a hazard mitigation plan, and they're important to recognize. They're very prescribed. FEMA has a checklist by which it uses to approve or not approve your plan. It's a short time frame. It looks at only five years. We've tried to put in longer-term actions, and FEMA Region 1 says, N -n 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 five years, and it includes all natural hazards. So it's, it's a certain animal and it has benefits, it positions the town for funding, but it, it has limitations as well. That's going on at the same time. So some risk concepts, what is risk? Um, I like math, um, I hope you all like math. It's a very <laughs> simple equation. Risk has two parts, what's vulnerable and how often does something happen? So if there's nothing vulnerable, there's no house on the beach, risk is low, even if the event is very frequent, or if there is a house on the beach, but nothing ever happens, there's no frequency, the frequency is zero, risk is also low. So you can see how if you have something that's vulnerable in the path of something that happens oftentimes, 
flood or erosion, risk is higher. That's all. So it's just a, a very brief equation. I've seen some people add them rather than multiply them. Whatever you want to do, just don't subtract them. <laughs> multiply, add, those are okay. So what are the risks uh, that we're covering? <clears throat> Flooding, erosion, wind associated with nor'easters and hurricanes, temperature increasing, precipitation becoming more intense, droughts becoming more flashy. This is a new buzzword, flashy droughts. Mm -hmm. If you haven't heard it, you've heard it here first, flashy <laughs> droughts and sea level rise. And there are secondary impacts to those. And uh, isolation seems like, you know, we're already isolated, right? But it's really the making isolation worse. Maybe the amount of time that you're cut off from the mainland is longer because something's happened to the, where the boats come in. Fragmentation on the island itself, some areas are cut off, like Millie's Bridge, et cetera. It's important to put our risks in a framework. And one of the first books I ever read as a child on my own without being required by a mean teacher was this 1980, maybe 1978 version of a USGS report about how, <laughs> what's so funny about that? <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, I don't like, I only like nonfiction. So, um, so this, you've seen this map. I hope you've seen this map. This is how Cape Cod and the islands were formed by the glaciation and the ice sheets and the, the moraines. And I'm not going to get into definitions because you can check this out and read it. Um, but this, the first two graphics show the retreat of the, the glacier. A moraine was left at Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard. Then a second moraine was left through the middle of the Cape. And these, of course, extend out, and, and that's what Block Island and Long Island are as, as well. After the glaciers retreated, sea level began rising. Okay, so the graphic on the right-hand side is uh, the brown was all land, and the blue was water right after the glaciers receded. So 12,000 years ago, that was your shoreline. It was pretty far out from where we are right now. You can see Nantucket is yellow. The brown is the shoreline. And how do they know this? They know this from sediment cores and that sort of thing and all the fancy stuff that, that they do. So that was 12,000 years ago. Here's a, a graphic on the left that I think um, was in a report a couple years ago. It's hard to find a higher res version of it, but there was some research related to the Stillwagon Bank. And so this is an image, and the image says the coastline 10,000 years ago was that outer dark brown line. So a big change between this brown blob and then 2,000 years later, the shoreline is much closer in, really almost at Sconset at that point. And then the right-hand graphic, of course, is today's shoreline. So important to just to have a framework in our heads. Sea level's been rising. And this, is, this one is sea level rise as well, but it just really looks back 50 years. The, the x-axis starts at 1965, and you can see a trend. It's very clear. Look, we're measuring this. We're measuring this in Bridgeport and New London and Boston and Nantucket. We know what's happening. Um, debating the causes is you know, something we're not doing tonight, but if we can measure it, we know what's happening. And it's just now you know, the public works directors that we work in and some of the towns who are old timers are finally saying, you know, I just don't see that rock anymore. I used to see it all the time. So we're hearing it on the ground. And the question, of course, is, you know, how is this going to continue? And what complicates everything here and in any coastal town is that risks are connected. So causes and effects are interrelated. It's very hard to pick them apart. Sea level rise, sea level is the base upon which floods occur, right? When FEMA draws its flood risk maps, it's using static sea level as its starting point. So if that's going up, flooding is supposedly going to get worse over time. And erosion will also, erosion rates will increase in some areas. Uh, and the floods and erosion, of course, together cause shoreline change. So, you know, this, the gear symbol is one of the things that PowerPoint lets you put in automatically. I wanted one with like 18 of them, but it only lets you pick three. But you can see how they're interrelated. And, uh, and the state has done a very good job um, mm. mapping in a geographic information system, how shorelines have changed statewide uh, over the last few decades, 100 years. And so you can get the data from the state. It might be from CZM, CZM data. And you can put it in your own GIS platform on your computer. And you can map out the different historical shorelines that are in, in a certain town or a certain area. And that's what we've done here. We've just taken the state's GIS data, put them in a map. And you can see shorelines where they used to be, especially off Medikit, you know, we're, we're significantly further to the south. But in some areas, such as the eastern part of the island, the lines are all on top of each other because the shoreline hasn't changed that much right there. But there are areas where it has changed significantly based on this mapping. This mapping only goes back 
only. It goes back 150 years. It can't go back thousands. We can do that with sediment cores and such, but it's really good data that the state provides. So the question, of course, is how that's going to change. And these are some of the, the arrows just kind of show, um, the arrows are based on comparing qualitative comparisons of the lines that were imported into the GIS. And you can see there are some areas, red is, is landward retreat, and blue is kind of uh, accretion in some areas, or possibly accretion. And then the flood risks, of course, flooding is what FEMA calculates for us, and it's very static. They look at the, the last time they had a mean water level and they build on top of that. And their job is to update the flood maps over time so that they keep up with, with rise, rising sea levels and storms. Okay, Noah's gonna give me a quick break, talk about how this is all changing going forward. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so that's, that's Dave kind of covered the uh, backwards perspective, not backwards perspective, looking backward perspective um, on, on all of the kind of uh, coastal hazards, natural hazards uh, that affect Nantucket. I'm gonna give a fairly brief overview of some of the future hazards. Um, there's a lot of great information out there and great data sets out there and great models out there that can provide various different um, kind of levels of detail about about future hazards. We're not going to dive like down the rabbit hole of of which specific um, what the specific numbers are right now, but it's going to give over overall trends um, and and what kinds of things we're looking at in the future. Um, so this this gives a pretty um, full overview of what <coughs> kinds of different uh, climate hazards we, we might be expecting to change in the future. Uh, accelerated sea level rise, more intense and frequent storms, increased precipitation um, separately from, in, from more frequent storms, so just overall more, more precipitation, more rain and snow, uh, more severe droughts, warming temperatures, and then a variety of other types of changes um, that are, that are related but not kind of as not direct climate changes but related caused by those changes in climate um, erosion accelerates as sea levels rise insects and tick-borne illnesses go up as temperatures go up changing seasonal patterns uh, impacts on agriculture changing habitats evolving fisheries and so on so accelerated sea level rise we'll all go to some some of those uh, specific examples there um, NOAA and USGS has put out uh, some updated projections in 2017. Um, CZM is working on getting more localized or regionalized uh, projections for the Massachusetts area. So uh, at this point, we're using the NOAA numbers that are just for the New England region generally. Um, and their, their most recent projections give the range by 2100. Uh, we're looking at between 2 and 10 feet um, of sea level rise from the, well, from approximately 2020, which we're at now. Um, so they also have, this is, this is from the NOAA website, this image on the right, uh, this is the um, whaling museum, and on the NOAA website they can show you, you know, what's this going to look like under different sea level rise projections. So this is six feet of sea level rise. Um, this will be the, the daily high tide uh, with, with six feet of sea level rise. So we didn't make it, Noah made it. The other <laughs> Not me, Noah. Noah, the NOAA. Um, and just one, one thing to. Do we have a clicker with the. Oh, um, point Yeah, that Okay, well, in the meantime. Um, so one thing to point out here so, so these projections, you know, some of them are accelerating more rapidly, some are a little bit, a little bit shallower acceleration. Um, but many of them reach six feet by 2100. So we, we're not sure exactly when this will happen, um, but it might happen as early as uh, 2065. It might happen in the 2090s. Um, you know, this purple line intermediate, it might be happening past 2100, but it's, it's coming. This is, this is the trend. Um, when that's coming, it's not entirely uh, agreed upon. It's high tide. High tide. Yes, this this is the yes the higher high tide of the day. So whichever one is higher. It's not a storm. Not a storm tide. It's not a storm. Not a storm tide. Sunny day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
So we can also we can map out what that looks like. So this is um, right. So I, I'm going to go through a couple of slides. This is the high sea level rise scenario. Um, I'll just go back to this previous slide for a second. Oh wait, this doesn't work. <laughs> um, so the high one is the red one, this red line there. So not the highest, but um, still pretty high. So this is this is current day, uh, the edge of the island. You can see the high tide in blue uh, or white. You know, just the way that the maps work out. Um, but then by the 2080s, we're looking at you know higher water coming in around downtown um, and a number of other areas. It's not, you know, from the bird's eye view, from, from I don't know, 20,000 feet up, it's like not uh, more than 200,000 feet up. It's not, it, it doesn't look that, that uh, impressive from this far away, um, but, you know, you can dive in and, and look more closely. And this map is also over in the corner over there. Um, so the kinds of things that we're looking at this impacting Madiket Harbor, downtown and Brand Point, uh, the communities around the harbor, um, Another important aspect, even if it's not directly impacting the communities, it might be you know, flooding roads and causing isolation of different areas. Um, and then a variety of, of other impacts. Uh, these are kind of ecological impacts, um, you know, breaching of ponds, flooding of wetlands, uh, and then those wetlands either need to migrate inland or they uh, convert into a different kind of habitat. So we're also looking at the shoreline change. It's the same image uh, that Dave showed you before. Um, and the, the data from CZM not, doesn't just have the you know, historic locations. It also calculates the, the rates over time. So there's long-term rates and there's short-term rates. Um, so what we did is we kind of, oh, <laughs> we kind of showed that into the future um, uh, under different different rates, so you know, looking at the long-term average rate, what's that look like by 2050 or 2670? A short-term rate, um, just to kind of get an idea of of what the kind of trends we're looking at. So that's actually what these arrows are showing. Um, the blue arrows are where those rates show that there might be uh, sand moving out into the water, and then the red arrows are where we're starting to lose some shoreline. Um, and we don't we don't know what this is going to look like. This is uh, just based on the general trends of the last hundred years. This is not a uh, modeled future uh, condition. Um, and importantly, sea level rise is going to change all of that. Um, first of all, it will accelerate erosion in places where erosion is already a problem. And second of all, you know, this kind of accretion of sand out into the water, if the sea level is rising at a similar rate, then you know, the, the new land just becomes buried again or drowned again. Um, and so that data and, and um, so a, a lot of the uh, uh, kind of climate data other than sea level rise and um, erosion, there's also uh, you know, changes in precipitation, changes in weather patterns. Um, and as part of the Massachusetts State House Mitigation and Climate Adaptation Plan, um, uh, resilient ma resilientma.org was put together. Um, this is a kind of clearinghouse for the regionalized climate change data that Massachusetts has been putting together. Um, so we have some good information, not just on what you know all of New England is going to look like in the future, but we can actually see. Um, county by county what, what Massachusetts will look like. So I'm going to just kind of go through some of those future uh, changes that we're expecting as well. Um, again, I'm not going to go into that much, you know, get into the nitty gritty so much, but the, the point is uh, here we're looking at an increase in the number of days every year with large storm events, more than two inches uh, per 24 hours. Um, so that's going to increase on Nantucket. Um, and it's going to increase more by, by 2070s. I forgot this too. Do you use maps on resilientmass.org? Yes, resilient, resilientma.org. Uh, that, that's down there. You, you can go look at the maps yourself. You can play around. It's, it's an interactive map, so you can choose which decades you want to go to, what features you're looking at. Um, and you can also download the data, and all of that data will, will be going into the plan uh, you know, in more uh, detailed formats. Um, so that, that, those last slides kind of show you this is an increase in like the intensity of storms that we're expecting or the, or the frequency of intense storms. Um, 
In addition, precipitation generally is expected to increase. Um, not, it's not, not a dramatic increase, uh, but this is showing by 2050s, you know, 1.64 inches more over what we have today, which is about 37.68 inches per year. Um, by the 2070s, two inches above what we have today. So not, not a very dramatic increase, but uh, you know, a, a slightly wetter environment. Um, on the other side of things, dry days, there's going to be a slight increase in the uh, expected drought conditions or frequency of droughts. Um, this actually is showing the kind of length of droughts. Um, so there'll be, there'll be longer droughts, uh, 2070s as well. And then general annual temperature will increase overall um, on an annual basis. So these are all, these are, you know, kind of expected trends. These are within the um, kind of general patterns of, of the region. More, more precipitation, more extreme weather events, uh, hotter temperatures, and um, more droughts, or more severe droughts. So now we get to do some voting. Um, so I think, who, who might not have picked up a clicker as you walked in? Yeah. Everyone else has one? No, why don't you put the, the ground rules up? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> not the ground rules, but the, the rules. Number. The instructions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll do this together. So, all right. So, uh, the way this is going to work is a question is going to come onto the onto the screen, and you have ten seconds. There'll be a little timer. You'll see it. Don't get stressed out. If you, if you press the wrong button, you can press a different one. It's going to record the last one you press. So. Again, you can change your answer within that 10 seconds, but once the clock is over, you can't have change your answer. But we're not voting for the president or even anyone, you know, at the local level. These are opinion questions, and they're just going to help us, they're going to help point us in the right direction, right? They're not going to, we're not using this to write the plan tonight, like I said. This is going to help steer us in the right direction. So, um, let's, we always start with an icebreaker that is not consequential. <laughs> and, and I want, let me just say, in Connecticut, this question is always Yankees or Red Sox, but not here. <laughs> Tonight we're doing this one instead. Well, so I'll just say before we go also, so you'll have 10 seconds after I like click a button, which, which you won't see. So don't, don't like start pressing away right away, you know, give it, give it a beat. So see the numbers? Uh, pick, pick one of those. We know there's six towns. Okay. Which one's the dry one? Two seconds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just the highest. No, that's where I want to live. All right. Okay. We finished. Yeah. Did, did everyone raise your hand if you did not get a chance to vote? Okay. I just want to see whether we, whether okay. All right. Well, this, these are the. Results. Uh, wow. <laughs> Wait, what was two? Don't go back. But it was, uh, <laughs> no, I was two. Two. Aquina, everyone wants to know. Jomar. Jomar, he's awesome. Yeah. 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 You guys know Manemptra's technically That's why no one voted for it. Okay. Wow. So now we're going to do, now we'll do the real questions because you practiced, okay? <laughs> so have you seen flooding become more frequent? Definitely, probability, probably unsure, probably not, definitely not. Okay, you have 10 seconds from when you see the clock show up in the bottom right corner. <laughs> so have you seen it become more frequent? So it's your opinion, have you seen it? What do you think? Okay. Flooding of any kind. All right. Okay. All right. Was that question geographically constrained? Or is no. it anywhere in the whole wide world? This, this geographic region. Yes, yes. My, I, so that's a good question. Thank you. These are all for the town. Town, town island, whatever you want to call the boundary. Yeah. <laughs> so this is this is Nantucket. This is not Maine. This is not Boston. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I see a friend. Okay. 
precipitation more intense. So not necessarily more over the whole year, but these rain bombs that, that come and just dump. That's true. Or what? snow. Or snow. Yeah. Precipitation. Snow bomb. <laughs> Isn't it called the bombogenesis? That's right. Bogenesis. Mm. Mm. Unsure you are. Yeah. 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 All right. Are <coughs> you yeah. using intensity as the weather service does? Inches per hour? Uh, yes, we are. Okay. Thank you. So droughts become more frequent or severe. Anticipating your question, we have no quantification here. Just it, it, whatever's a drop in your mind. more frequent or severe. This could be summer, winter. We're not going to worry about that right now. The gusts, driving the waves. I think we're going to see some of those. Good spread. A couple of those. Okay. That might be it. No, there's one more. This, this is the hardest one. <laughs> So if you pick other, we will ask you to elaborate in the second hour. Most, most urgent climate-related challenge here. Giving you extra time here. to think about it before I start the clock. Not in California, not somewhere else here. All right. Saying is not important. <laughs> okay. Storms and erosion, more frequent storms and erosion is the winner for this question. Okay. Canceling more boats. All right. Mm -hmm. I think this was yeah, funny. Yeah, go. I've been there, done that. Okay, so um, we're going to go Thank kind you. of tie things around, tie, wrap, wrap things back to the beginning a little bit. Um, so the risk, risk is vulnerability and frequency question. Uh, so we just, we just talked a lot about the different kinds of risk that we're looking at. Um, and this is to give you an idea of what we do on our end when we're kind of quantifying the risk across the island. Um, so we're looking at, again, the, the vulnerability of different assets, different areas or, or um, systems on Nantucket, uh, and then the frequency of uh, um, how often they're exposed to different types of risk. Um, another way to think about that actually is not just the frequency but the area of impact specifically for like a system. So for example if we're looking at Nantucket roads, um, we might look at Nantucket roads, how, how at risk they are to erosion. If there's one, one section of road that's at high risk but the rest of the road system is not, that's not a very high risk. But if the entire system is at risk uh, or, or exposed, then that is a higher risk. So the left-hand column here can be the frequency or it can be the uh, spatial area of risk. Kind of both of those can work. Um, so again, we might look at, is it exposed at the daily high tide to high water if we're looking at flooding? Is it exposed only during chronic storms, like an annual storm? Or are we talking about only during major storms is it going to be exposed? Alternatively, we might look at something and say, okay, the entire island is at risk of this, or only a specific site is at risk, and so on. So we take this, this framework of looking at uh, infrastructure and assets and things that we care about, um, or we, we look at different, yeah, no, I stand by what I just said. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we look at a variety of different assets or features. So um, this is kind of phenomenon. So we might look at a beach and the degradation of that beach. So here we have like the asset and the hazard that we're that is exposed to. So bluffs being eroded, beaches being degraded, and we we 
place all these things within this um, within this table to rank where it is at risk. You know, how does it fit among, uh, on this table? Is it uh, highly vulnerable and highly frequently affected, or highly vulnerable but affected very infrequently, so on and so forth. Um, and this is important, generally, as a way to classify risk, but also because when we're talking about climate change and, and the changing hazards, that has an effect on the risk of the different assets. As the risk increases, uh, the, the frequency of exposure to different hazards increases as sea level rises, frequency of exposure to flooding increases, frequency of erosion events is going to increase. Um, so <coughs> the overall risk is going to increase. Um, so our goal then, what we can control, is the vulnerability. So if vulnerability keeps increasing, then the risk is going to go up a lot. Our goal to become resilient is to decrease vulnerability such that we can actually decrease the risk even in the face of uh, increasing frequency of events or increasing uh, spatial area of hazards. So um, kind of a first pass view of this, um, we've, we've done a fair amount of background work, but this is just kind of an overall representation of the kind of things that we are going to look at. And a big purpose of what we're here tonight is to find out more from you about what I'm about to say, which is where are these hot spots? Um, we expect inundation in these areas. Do you agree? Disagree? Where else do you think that will happen? Um, that's a question to answer during the next hour. Same with erosion, where are we looking at those kinds of risks? Unstable banks and erosion, um, and then other changes, changes to habitat, um, recreational changes, and so on. And then where are we looking at isolation? You know, just the roads are going to be uh, flooded out or eroded, so we have to deal with that. I think we're, let's see, it's about 5.45, so we're doing okay with time. Um, so we're going we're gonna to do a little bit of an introduction to how to adapt and become more resilient. And we don't want to overplay this right now because we want some direction from all of you in the second hour about where we should focus our efforts. So like I said earlier, and I'm going to repeat it again, I know I'm sort of beating, a, beating the issue at this point, is we're not going to go back and write a plan for how to Nantucket can protect itself. That's not our goal. We want to hear your opinions tonight, and then that'll steer us in the right direction. But suffice to say... 1990, um, I was just coming out of college, and, and this, is, this is kind of a hot topic at universities at the time, maybe not in the general public, but there were three types of adaptation that were discussed. Retreat, which is get out of the way. Accommodate, which is live with what's going on, live with the flooding, live with the erosion. And protection, which is keep the water out, stop the erosion, whatever you have to do. And we're going to do that in New York City, right? That's our job, is to protect Manhattan. And we're going to do it in some other places too. Um, we're going to retreat in some areas. Even if we don't do it intentionally, the market will do it for us. And, but I think what's really intriguing is accommodation, which, um, which we used to have as a viable third option. As time goes on, we're seeing it as, as kind of less viable. 12 years ago, when we did the hazard mitigation plan, the stilt house was an example of accommodation. Why? Someone, someone just shout out, why was that an example of accommodation? It's on stilts. Yeah. So it could flood. Has, how's that worked out? <laughs> How, accommodation works until it doesn't, right? So it kind of makes you think about that, that middle option a little bit, a little bit more. Fortunately, over the years, we've added to our, our toolbox of resilience options. We don't just have those three. We have a bunch of subsets of categories. What we do with roads, elevate them, um, retire them. I've seen roads retired in some towns. There's a town north of Boston that retired a road and then regretted it later. Um, shoreline management, living shorelines, managing sediment, bioengineered banks, other kinds of traditional shore protection structures, elevating buildings, floodproofing buildings, uh, directing development in different areas, um, regulation, ordinances, development limits, building standards, building codes. Those are often handed down by the state, but some states have very weak building codes. The towns can do more. And then emergency management is always an important aspect of resilience because you have to be able to get to people, get to your shelters, etc. Resilience and adaptation are very scale dependent. This is a really important concept that I, I want to make sure I emphasize. You can do something at a regional scale, at kind of a sub-regional scale, or at a site-specific scale. 
You can put a flood barrier in the front of a building. We, any of us can do that. Tomorrow we can just go to our building and put a barrier on it or buy sandbags. That's fine, that works at the site scale. Do you do something at a regional scale or town-wide? That's a decision you know, that hasn't been, uh, we haven't decided that yet. We need to, need to figure that out. So we have a few more voting questions and then we'll take a break. Um, so everyone still has, you haven't put away. Don't put it in your pocket and forget about it. If we don't go home with these, I'm in big trouble tomorrow. Okay. So earlier we were voting on risks, our perceptions of risks. Now we're talking about kind of where to take that information next. So which of the following needs to be addressed first? Okay. There's your timer. We've got some public assets, some private assets. And, and again, the question was first, not only. I think that's great. I think you guys are great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Okay. Um, what do you think should be Nantucket's primary approach to building resilience? And the word building means causing, not we, that's the context we mean, not in a building itself. So retreat from at-risk areas, accommodate hazards temporarily or longer, protecting some combination, or I don't know yet. It's fair to say a combination or I don't know yet. Okay, timer's going. I love you guys. <laughs> I really do. Do we have prizes for all of them? <laughs> You're all very fair-minded people, I can tell. All right, so now we're just gonna do one example. We don't care about this bridge more than any other. We don't love you more if you live there, but we love you anyway. But we wanted an example just to show you how we would build that kind of, that that bingo square, that matrix. Could you define community, please? Yeah. So all of you, the town, people who live, work, recreate here, the community. So Wisconsin to Madagascar. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's a little bit tricky. I mean, if you don't live there, you might, um, you know, have a different opinion, and that's okay. That's why we're voting. So how important is the bridge? Low, moderate, medium, high, extreme importance. So maybe the words don't fit. This, is, this means very, not as much, okay? Impact on the community, if damaged. Okay. That makes sense. So that's, that's one question about it. And then the next question is, how frequently is the bridge exposed to hazards? In your, this is your opinion. So if you don't, if you've never seen it exposed to hazard and you have to guess, that's okay. That's all right. So events capable of damaging the bridge occur rarely, occasionally, regularly, frequently, or constantly. Okay. Opinion, opinion, opinion. Okay. That's probably a good barometer of what's going on, I would think. So then, Noah, do you remember what the? Yeah. Okay. Mid-range on both, kind of, right? It's two and a three. Yeah. <clears throat> so then what, what, the kind of thing that we could do, and again, this is just an example, <clears throat> is we would take that two and we take the three and we kind of go to the middle of the, near the middle of the risk matrix, and we would say that the risk is, is moderate. So, frequency is changing, we've talked about that. So we've got to make sure that we take these ideas and kind of think forward with them. So we're gonna finish the presentation part and we're gonna have a five minute break because 
Uh, I gave the explanation of the second hour while I was certain the PowerPoint was done for. Whew. Um, I don't need to give a long explanation of the second hour again, but some of you did come in a little bit later. So while you're copying down the survey link, I'm going to tell you, um, if you do not want to use the internet, we have paper copies of the survey. So what I would ask is if you fill out a paper copy, you can leave it tonight or you can give it to, to Chuck or to Libby, but don't also take the survey online. Just pick one or the other. So I will pass these around. Again, feel free. You could also take one just kind of like to do a dry run. That's fine. So we'll take a break, have some snacks, and we're going to come back. Um, oh, you have a question. Do we need to hang on? No, that's about what I was going to say is please, please return them right now. <laughs> some of us have a boat to get on later. We cannot stay overnight. <laughs> we did not bring our contact lens solution, so we can't stay overnight. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so one more reminder to please return your clickers if you have not. One more reminder to please just check your pockets if you think you might still have one. It looks like some car starters, right? Easy to confuse them. All right. So I'm going to pass out the, the dots. So there's, a, there's plenty for everyone, so don't worry about not getting one. You're going to go up to... Each neighborhood has a board about risks. You're gonna put dots on three of the risks and then two of the options. Risks are on the top, options are on the bottom, or they're side by side, depending on how we plotted it. The dots for voting on the risks and the options. If you have a comment, words that you wanna say, there's post-it notes on each one of them. I have to implore you to please <coughs> not get Sharpie on the walls. We'll probably be in big trouble <laughs> Lady's looking at me like, no, this can't happen. So, you know, just take the post-it note and, you know, use, use your arm or, an el or your elbow or a book or something to do your writing, then put it up, okay? So the dots are for voting in the boxes. Three risks, two options, your favorite. Colors don't matter. Post-it notes are for comments, okay? So we're just going to pass out, and then just feel free to get up. Here, take, take, some, take one sheet and pass it down. Take the sheet and pass it down. We're getting some we're getting some questions about the the survey link. Chuck, what's the new, he's writing down the town's new web page for this. So we're just going to try to do a little bit of a report out. This is, uh, everyone's, it's informal at this point, so we're just going to kind of go to each board. No, we'll start at that end. I'll start at this end. We'll take turns, and we'll just tell you what we see. Everyone can kind of see from where they're sitting where the votes kind of played out. But actually, I do see some differences, so that's good. All right, uh, why don't you start? Go ahead. 
So just start with this. Yep. All right, can everyone hear me? Um, all right, so this is the airport neighborhood, um, which is the airport and the surrounding neighborhood. Um, in terms of the risks, we have um, a close first with erosion, it looks like, followed by uh, high wind events. Um, and after that, we have flood inundation and then uh, a vote for intense precipitation. So erosion seems to be the, the main risk that people assigned to uh, the airborne neighborhood, um, which matches with, with other things that we've heard. Uh, and then somebody made a comment, redundant power supply uh, at the airport, which is important for continued operations. Um, did anybody have any, anything that they wanted to share specifically about this? Okay, I'll hop down to the adaptation options. Um, so a pretty even spread across protect, accommodate, accommodate followed by retreat, and retreat. Uh, yeah, not, I'd have to count them up. No, no one of them appears to take the lead uh, from first glance. Okay, so and you've probably noticed these are not arranged geographically. We kind of did that on, on purpose just to keep it mixed up. I have the northeastern part of the island of the town and um, on the risk board, uh, I will note that there are no comments on the post-it note and there are no comments on the post-it note for the uh, adaptation board either. In terms of the voting um, for the risks, flood and erosion by and large have the most votes. And I'm a little bit surprised about the flood inundation, um, although the, the breach um, to the pond that I cannot pronounce, thank you, uh, does sort of count as, as flooding. But this area I didn't realize had a lot of inundation risk. I thought it was a little bit higher, so I might be learning something here, which is good. They may be thinking of going further north. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Squam Road was underwater quite a bit because of flooding right. wind runoff ponds. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. That may be. And then for the uh, for adaptation, we have um, accommodate and then accommodate followed by retreat as the I think sort of the winners. Maybe retreat and accommodate are kind of equally. Not much protect. And that you know that sort of makes some sense. I don't know. I don't know who would be looking at doing a lot of protection up here. That seems like something pretty far out in time or very costly. Okay, back to. <laughs> uh, good, <laughs> good neck exercise. Um, your chairs also are on wheels, so if you need to turn the whole thing, you know. Um, all right, for Tom Nevers, uh, erosion and wind events again were noted as the the largest uh, risks to the neighborhood. Um, in terms of Adaptation options, uh, accommodate followed by retreat, and retreat were, were the top options chosen. Um, so, yeah, that's, not sure what to say about that. No, that's good. <laughs> Less is more. Okay, uh, so I have sort of the southern part of, the, the southern part of the eastern half of the harbor. There are other neighborhood names that we know of, but we thought we'd just generalize it and call it Harbor South. So for the risks, flood, in, flood inundation and erosion are the two winners here. Wind is kind of the third. Interesting to see intense precipitation kind of getting some love um, here. And maybe we'll see more of that. Actually, we should see that. I hope we see that for the downtown area. I can't see that far. Um, and then for the adaptation methods, uh, a lot of accommodation, well, really, it's pretty well spread. So protect, accommodate, accommodate followed by retreat, and then a little bit of retreat. I do want to note that there's comment cards. Um, Pulpus and Nantucket Harbors, largest expanse, expanses of salt marsh, uh, susceptible to uh, erosion and drought. And then down here, protection, natural protection of marshes to protect shoreline erosion. That's a great idea. And we haven't talked about that much tonight, but nature-based defenses are something that are very important to consider. We're finally kind of getting a handle around um, what we should be doing, living shorelines and nature-based. And finally, we're starting to have some evidence-based solutions. Like, because up until this point, it's all been, oh, I think this is going to be good. We should just do it. And now I'm starting to see reports in the literature about what really happens if you build a living shoreline or bioengineer a bank. So we're starting to have some good evidence-based uh, examples out there. So I'm glad to see that comment. 
back to Noah. Um, so uh, the Sconset neighborhood erosion was highlighted as the top risk, uh, which makes a lot of sense, um, along with wind events and also intense precipitation uh, was voted a lot for that. I wonder if anybody uh, had any, anybody who put that sticker had any comments about, about that? About, about the uh, intense precipitation. Have they experienced intense precipitation there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think when there's a lot of heavy rain, it's been washing down the side of the bluff and accelerating the erosion. And okay, so that's a connection to erosion. All right. Well, I'll that later. Um, and then in terms of the adaptation options, uh, kind of a trending towards accommodation followed by retreat um, and, re and retreat. All right, I've got Surfside up next, which is a great um, area to look at because of the wastewater beds. So for the risks, um, flood inundation, erosion, wind events, but erosion, I think, is probably the winner here, and that's you know what you've all experienced in this part of the, the town. Flood inundation certainly would be the case where some of the lower elevations of the beach are maybe breakthroughs to the ponds. On the, and there's no comment on the post-it note for the risks. On the adaptation, resilience measures, a lot of accommodation followed by retreat um, for votes. That's definitely the winner here. Uh, that, you know, that makes some sense, I think. It's um, an area where Eventually, there may be no choice but to retreat in some discrete areas, but we should accommodate in the meantime, especially when we have major infrastructure and a lot of residential. There are comments on post-it notes here. Map scale is too large, protection of key infrastructure. Yeah, we, we always struggle with the map scales, and we do apologize. It's hard to kind of drill down at this scale. Sewer beds were mentioned, also protecting more habitat, and then possibly a different strategy for sewer beds, and that is something that we definitely need to look at in this planning process. For, for Madiket, uh, flood, inundation, and erosion were identified as the, as the main hazards, which matches information that we've collected. Um, and then for the uh, adaptation options, again, accommodate, accommodating, accommodate followed by retreat, and retreat. There are a lot of comments on this one. Um, so one person noted that it would be nice to see property values for the maps um, as an important kind of thing to consider while, uh, while you know, trying to decide what kind of adaptation approach makes sense. Um, protect and accommodate as a combination rather than just accommodate uh, and protect separately. Um, what category would zoning building changes uh, come under, so, you know, kind of not, not non-structural approaches, but just the zoning changes and building, building ordinance, um, and then some examples. You could designate parcels as unbuildable, reduce the den density, uh, move land use to a less intense kind of use. Um, so, you know, not necessarily just retreating from the area, but kind of controlling how the area is, is developed um, and continued to be maintained. Um, Keep natural HSY. Oh, somebody signed it. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Keep it natural. Uh, functioning wetlands. So talking about Hither Creek over here. Protecting Hither Creek and marsh systems. Protection of harbors and harbor access. Um, it does not necessarily need to be hard armoring. Uh, extensive wetland systems already um, buffer storms and rain, so enhance those wetland systems. Okay, and then the, uh, we'll wrap up with the downtown area, which we've kind of combined with Brand Point, even though there's some differences, there's some similarities. It's great to see, I mean, you guys really understand what's going on, flood inundation, intense precipitation. So all the votes here under intense precipitation, you understand that there are drainage systems and they were sized, or maybe they were not sized. If they were very old, they were just put in. So they may not be sized for our future precipitation intensities, and maybe that's something that needs to be looked at, especially if it's happening at the same time as very high tides, and then you can have surcharging. Um, but of course, flood inundation, uh, 
from the harbor as well as a concern and um, you know other things some other votes kind of thrown in there the adaptation measures resilience measures I see a lot of protect and accommodate and that I think is you know appropriate like I said we're not gonna give up New York City Manhattan um, centuries from now or thousands of years from now this is this is still needs to be there right this is the heart of the town so I'm not saying it's more important but governmental functions are here and um, services are here and so we need to kind of do what it takes to um, to protect it and accommodate remember accommodate means living with water not keeping it away so we'll need to be looking at ways to live with water and people who live in Brant Point are kind of already doing that some of the sticky notes don't retreat protect the salt marshes duck bills for storm drains it's a good idea oftentimes works can be costly but um i'm just now i'm editorializing i'm going to stop <laughs> uh, identify low spots and plan plans to block them and there's hsy again <laughs> okay so this has been great if you didn't see your neighborhood we did have some other boards but we we kind of felt like there was a lot of information overload but we did have boards for um for Tucker Nook Island, and what else do we have boards for? North Shore. North Shore. The, yeah, the yeah we did have some boards Shore. that kind of focused on that. And so pull us aside by all means if you, you feel like it's something that's important to talk about tonight. Um, we're pretty much done, but I think it would be appropriate to have Chuck and Libby have kind of the last word. If you have anything you want to want to say about about what happens next, or I could just do it. <laughs> Uh, okay. I appreciate everybody's turnout. This uh, really exceeded my expectations. Mm -hmm. So please, you oh, know, yeah. we have additional workshops. Participate uh, again and bring your friends. Uh, I think this is. So, in terms of follow up, we have another workshop on July 18th at 6 o'clock, and I don't remember where it is yet. We'll, um, we'll, confirm, the room. we'll confirm the room. Downstairs, thank you, Florencia. It's downstairs in the community room. So one of the um, thoughts I had was we maybe we need a bigger room. We, we had a pretty good crowd tonight. I think it was a little bigger than we thought it might be. Um, we've also had some, some inter internal talk, and also we met with the Nantucket Coastal Conservancy recently about other ways to do public outreach besides workshops and we talked a bit about a kind of a road show idea where maybe we go to other groups like the town association or community association or maybe we go to the hayloft at bartlett's and do a, a thing there so we were hoping to maybe just ask you all now it, um what do you have any ideas about how to get additional community input we've got the survey um if, if you have any thoughts about it we'd really love to hear them or you can tell us later. Well, I think it would be really useful to reach out to the on-island scientific community um, and get direct input from people who are already collecting data at various sources and also would be willing to collect data that is necessary. Yeah. So is please get in touch. Yeah, and, they like, <laughs> and Noah's writing this down. Okay. So. okay. Yeah. Oh, perfect. That would be yeah. great. That's really helpful. No. Yeah. Could you write smaller, please? <laughs> any any other thoughts that people have about outreach would it be easier to engage yeah. the summer community by hosting something in place it seems to me every afternoon be... wait oh, sorry go ahead i'm um, sorry um this young lady here was saying maybe have something at the whaling museum possibly that might be a good idea it just might be easier to engage yeah. the summer community sure and see if they have any thoughts on this mm -hmm. mm -hmm. no. i know that there's a lot of division usually between what we have to say good rick what were you going to say don't you have to go to the brewery well actually that came up um earlier we were talking about the brewery yeah that, that can be fun and informative. Back. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> Josh? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm glad to see that there's one in the summer because the summer residents are an important part of our island. Um, and I'd love to see one in Wisconsin. 
sure the casino would be happy to host. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Great. Or in Madiket. <laughs> Madiket, Admiralty could be a good, a good area. There's a couple of films that are going to be shown in the near future, too, and uh, those are good outreach. Um, one's called Sand Wars, and the other one's called um, Rising Tides, and they both talk about you know, problems facing coastal communities. Yeah, good, good idea. And when, when, if we have the dates on those? Yeah, um, Sand Wars is going to be 29th. May 29th. And uh, Rising Tides is going to be June 25th. Both of them will be in the Great Hall at the Athenaeum, and they'll be followed by discussion. And um, the Coastal Conservancy is going to be co-sponsoring them with the Civic League and the Madiket Area Residents Association. And sort of the good news is that um, Rising Tides uh, has a portion of it that was shot here on Nantucket and one of the collaborators was Sarah Otai, Dr. Otai, and um, we are going to be bringing Sarah back for the showing of that documentary and she will be on the island for about three days and we hope to plan some events around her being Excellent. That oh, yeah. those are great um, events so that we can push out. All those in one location. You know, yes. We have a section on our web page where we can events or activities relating to coastal resiliency. Yeah, yeah that's a good idea. One idea is, and in fact, it was mentioned by one of the board members from the Madiket Association about connecting the dots with what we've done before in terms of the um, coastal management plan and Sarah will be key to doing that mm -hmm. and we thought we could maybe structure a conversation with her around that process what worked what didn't work what were the lessons learned Sarah was a big part of the, the first hazard mitigation plan as well so she's a good continuity for, for David that. also the updates of the um, Nantucket and Madigan Harbors plan mm -hmm. which was like a comprehensive process that involved the community so um, having Sarah here with a little perspective that she's gained from yeah. distance and time and geography I think can really be helpful excellent and Any? so we've just tried to get all those onto our web page in one Great. place okay and if we're missing anything let us know we'll dig them out and put them on there but the page is a wonderful resource Chuck so it's you just go to the town website and in the search bar type in coastal resiliency and Chuck has a whole page with a lot of resources. Uh, um, Chuck and Florencia just recently worked on redoing that page to make it, make it I think a little easier to read and So you can find use, a survey. use that resilientac.org is kind of a shortcut. Okay. It's something you can remember probably on the top of your head as opposed to, you know, a few extra steps to go in through the town webpage. I, I would just one suggestion I'm just thinking seeing Holly here is that from the planning department and Holly <coughs> went to a, um, a conference in Newport about how to deal with coastal resiliency and inundation in a historic district and that mm -hmm. that presents really unique challenges for us and maybe we could just have something that would focus in on that and you could share with us some of the strategies you've learned and what are communities like Charleston and Newport and Baltimore doing. I think we could learn a lot from that. Um, Melissa, I think, left Philbrook, but she has oh, talked to me a little bit about Remain helping to sponsor a, a more downtown-oriented forum or, or two, I think, or, or outreach efforts. For, for something like that, so so we could certainly talk to her about that. Another organization is the Preservation Institute. They did mm -hmm. a bunch of flood mapping. They brought a, I think from um, from South Carolina maybe brought a Professor up, and they did a whole bunch of flood mapping. So that might be another good great resource. Yeah. Preservation Institute, I believe. It's good to hear the comment about historic resources. That's something that we oftentimes forget in the resilience community. We do, David, and it's. To who we are. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, last week I was fortunate enough to atta attend an island energy conference and the subject was resiliency, resilient together, and actually I presented on their panel of uh, 
called On the Front Lines, because islands, of course, are on the front lines of uh, and the most vulnerable to climate change and rising sea levels and everything. And a lot of the discussion had to do with um, redundant energy supply and, you know, even with the upgrades that are happening on Nantucket, at best that could supply 50% of the island and our, what are we doing to ensure our critical facilities get that power? What are we doing in terms of microgrid planning? Because these are what other island communities that were represented there from Rhode Island to Alaska to North Carolina, that is what everyone was discussing also in the new day and age of possible grid attacks. So what are we doing in terms of a resilient energy future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, exactly yeah, that'll be worked into the plan, I would imagine. But uh, uh, I'm sure we'll be talking much more with you about that. Josh? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sure you're trying to wrap up, but this is really very helpful thing, I think. And I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that this process is something that can um, help the community in a way that kind of gets beyond some of the divisiveness that we we've seen in some areas. Is there a, an approach, besides just reflecting and engaging us on what our thoughts are kind of off the cuff here, is there, are there things that you can provide in terms of criteria for helping to make the gray area calls that all of this implies? That we, Because, you know, all of us want to think about this in a logical, systematic, fair-minded way. Uh, how do we there are criteria that you can help share in the future, not today. But there are, there are. I mean, it's to the answer to the question. It's essentially making sure that we provide a good decision-making framework. So how to navigate those tough choices, and it isn't. It doesn't happen in one meeting, as you, as you suggested. It's over the course of several. It's a whole planning process. But we oftentimes look at what other communities are doing, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, but sometimes that is not entirely relevant. Sometimes it comes down to what's important here. So, yeah, it's things to, thank you. I can't answer your question entirely, but it's a good point. Maybe just one last kind of general comment and kind of piggyback on what Lauren was saying is like, I feel like a converse, you know, the scope seems very focused on like coastal matters and I think we should have some discussion about like how much food backups do we have? If we have like a really bad Category 5 hurricane, like how long do we have? Or you know, battery backups are important. Or, you know, I, I feel like a little increase in scope to a certain extent, although focusing on this piece is important. So yeah. A little bit in scope is, you know, how are we resilient individually and as a community and as a neighborhood? I think that just having that new conversation that's a good point. And, and a couple of times that you saw the word isolation up there, that's what we were kind of getting at. It wasn't just the physical isolation, but kind of like the drawn out, being cut off from not having the things that you're describing. That's where that would kind of come into play. So we can, we can look at that as well. I think we're okay to adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.